Yes, good morning. Thanks, uh, thanks again for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure to be back in uh, Mexico after not having been here for a couple of years. So in the next half an hour or so, uh, we're going to talk about ECMO. Um, here are a couple of disclosures. I, probably more than the industry stuff, uh, I work at an ECMO center, and uh, so I'm a, I have some believer bias. ECMO is not a new concept, not entirely new. The first uh, case report of VV ECMO being used, uh, published here in the New England Journal in 1972, um, shows a machine that takes up the better part of, uh, better part of the room. Um, and this is a, a case report of successful use of, of ECMO to save a patient dying of trauma. Of course, we've had lots of technological advances and now we have ECMO machines that uh, you can carry in, in one hand. ECMO is a modification of the cardiopulmonary bypass circuit. Um, and it can be used for both pulmonary or cardiac support. Today I'm going to focus on pulmonary support for ARDS. Um, we've got lots of experience using this in children and, ne and neonates for decades. But there's new enthusiasm and new data, which we'll talk about in adults. For those of you who are not uh, used to this, let me just quickly show you how this works. Typically, we have two large cannula that are inserted, one in the femoral vein that goes all the way up to the border between the right atrium and the, and the inferior vena cava, and a return cannula that's usually inserted in the jugular vein and sits just uh, in the superior vena cava. Then we suck blood out from below, push it through an oxygenator, which puts in oxygen, takes out CO2, and then returns the blood more or less in the same spot that it was taken in, in VV ECMO. And the membrane oxygenator is a hollow fiber uh, membrane lung, and it works kind of like a dialysis circuit, right? So we pump in blood, and in a countercurrent way, gas passes and moves down its uh, diffusion gradient, oxygen being added, CO2 being moved out. One of the first randomized trials ever done in intensive care medicine was done using ECMO. This NIH study published by Warren Zapol um, showed no effect of using venoarterial ECMO in patients with ARDS. And in fact, survival rates were terrible in both groups, 90% of patients died, and everybody said, whoa, ECMO doesn't, certainly does not help. But there are, looking back on this now, there are lots of things that in retrospect we can say may, would have been done better in a different way. They used venoarterial ECMO, which is really circulatory support when the problem was not heart failure. They had very high levels of anticoagulation and part of the problem here was huge amounts of bleeding. And when this trial was designed, there was very little thought of lung protective ventilation, and there was no adjustment of, of mechanical ventilation in the ECMO group. So what changed our thinking about ECMO? And let me tell you, our thinking has changed. These are, this is the report from, a, from the ELSO registry in the United States, collecting data from all over the world, though. And you can see whether you're talking about the number of centers that are doing ECMO, the red bars, or the number of cases of ECMO that are, number of runs that are, that are happening, you can see this is in adults for respiratory failure, a huge increase in the last decade, rising exponentially. But why is this? Well, part of it is, is because we always had some centers that really were pioneering ECMO, and this is the report from the University of Michigan, which is showing up as a very small uh, slide up here. They still were doing mostly neonates, some kids, but an increasing amount of adult respiratory failure, and they were reporting mortality rates of, you know, 50%, 40%, not 90%. And then a couple of things happened about 10 years ago. We had the H1N1 uh, pandemic, which you will all remember very well because it started uh, here. 
Um, but ECMO was used a lot in certain centers. And reports showing, in this observational way, huge reductions in mortality, very low mortality, whether you were talking about matching reports here or just looking uh, directly. And at the same time, there was a new, so the first kind of modern era randomized trial um, that was reported in The Lancet in 2009. This is the CSER study uh, done by Giles Peake and colleagues in Leicester in the UK. And they randomized patients to either stay in their referring center and be managed there or be transported to Leicester for consideration of ECMO. And as you can see here, they showed a statistically significant, just, uh, effect on six months uh, morta uh, six month mortality, death and severe disability at six months significantly significantly better, um, and mortality just around a p value of 0 0.07, almost uh, significantly different. So you might say, well, that's great. Why wasn't why didn't we believe all this ten years ago? Well, these numbers are are small, and they're subject to if you change just one or two deaths in the other group, suddenly the statistical significance disappears. And you say, well, what about that H1N1 data? Well, here on the right is a paper from Australia, a cohort of patients with H1N1 who all got ECMO, 68 uh, patients, young, very uh, low PF ratio, all of them treated with ECMO. On the other side is a cohort from Utah where they had no ECMO, again, very uh, young, pretty sick, PF ratio similar, point, uh, 61. Nobody got ECMO. And uh, hmm, survival rates are pretty much the same, suggesting that, that maybe these H1N1 patients are different and, and maybe we, we can't uh, extrapolate all the way. At the same time, another reason that we want to be careful about the expanding use of ECMO is that there's a very clear volume outcome relationship. This is something that we know exists for many things that we do, and it just makes sense, right? If I'm going to look after a patient with ARDS, I'm probably going to be better at it if I do it every week rather than once a year. But here are numbers, from the, again, from the ELSO registry. And when you compare centers that do fewer than five cases per year with those that do more than 30 cases a year, that high-volume center has 40% lower mortality because there's... ECMO is a complicated thing, and it requires teamwork and practice to, to do it well. So in that context, <clears throat> we now have new data that, uh, that came out last year, the EOLIA trial, where Alain Combes from Paris was the principal investigator. This was done in collaboration with the International ECMO Network and published in the New England Journal uh, last May, released uh, at the American Thoracic Society meeting. This is their study question that I've got up here. They at, we asked if, in patients with very severe ARDS, <clears throat> does a strategy of earlier VV ECMO decrease 60-day mortality compared with a strategy of usual care, including lung protective ventilation, prone positioning, and using ECMO only as rescue therapy when the patient's really dying? Patients, we had 200, 249 patients randomized <clears throat> from 64 centers. A lot of them were in Paris um, and would transport patients who were randomized to the ECMO arm. The, the ECMO team would go and put them on ECMO at the other center and bring them back to uh, the Pitier in, in, uh, in Paris as a center, center for ECMO. It took a long time uh, to get these. It's difficult to randomize patients when they're this sick. So... You know, six years of recruitment um, and only uh, 249 patients. People got into the trial for one of three reasons. They had a PF ratio below 50 for three hours, 16, so not very many got in like that. They had a PF ratio less than 80 <clears throat> for six hours. That was the majority of patients who were randomized. But also, <clears throat> there was a significant group who were random, who were eligible, not because of terrible hypoxemia, but because of problems with hypercapnia and high ventilatory pressures. 
patients were randomized to either VV ECMO or to usual care, as I've already outlined. And the study was stopped early by the Data Monitoring Committee after a predefined uh, analysis suggested that it was going to be futile to continue. But the important thing here when you think, when you hear futile, is not to say that the treatment is futile, but the chances of finding a statistically significant difference were very low. Baseline characteristics. These, again, sorry, these slides are projecting smaller than, uh, than they should be, perhaps. But I'll just point out that the median time to getting patients onto ECMO was short, but 24 hours. And still, 50 to 60% of patients in both groups had already been in the prone position before being randomized. The, there was an experiment done in this trial. So you can see the red group is the ECMO group. This is the number of patients. So almost everybody randomized to ECMO got ECMO. And a small proportion of the other group on any given day was receiving ECMO. We'll talk more about that in a second. And importantly, this was a strategy of using ECMO to protect the lung. So PEEP was relatively similar in both groups, but immediately upon going on to ECMO, there's a large reduction in tidal volume uh, that was intentional in the ECMO group. Here are the main results. A nice separation and a almost, but not quite, statistically significant difference, a p-value of 0.07. If we look at this numerically, we're talking about 46% mortality in the control group and 35% mortality in the intervention group with a p-value of 0.09 when you do it like this. So this is why when you read the abstract in the New England Journal, it says ECMO does not statistically significantly reduce mortality in patients with very severe ARDS. But that's not the end of the story. A predefined subgroup was anticipating that there was going to be a lot of crossover in the, uh, in the control group. And in fact, a significant proportion crossed over. When you compare the ECMO group versus the control group and count death or crossover, there's a very big difference between the two groups. And you might say, well, that's a little too, uh, that's a little too much. Not everybody who crossed over might, might not have died. Um, and you say, okay, well, what if, so actually 33% of the, uh, if you say right now, I can't get my pointer to work here. The base case scenario is that everybody dies. That's P by point one. What if 10% or 20% or even a third of these crossover patients would have survived without ECMO, still there's a statistically significant uh, difference between groups. And these, these patients were really sick at the time of crossover. So 28% of the control group crossed over. They had an average PF ratio of 51, SATs of 77%, pH very low, PCO2 high. Nine of them had a, already had a, had a cardiac arrest, and six of them had to be rescued with eCPR for ECMO. So this, this was a pretty sick uh, crossover group. And 50%, 57% of them died even despite uh, going on ECMO versus 41% was the mortality rate in the patients who did not need to be rescued. I'll point out that even after you took out 28% of the sickest control group patients, the mortality in the rest of the controls was still numerically higher than the ECMO mortality of 35%. I'm just going to skip that. Interestingly, in subgroup analyses, it wasn't the patients who were dying of hypoxemia where we had the strongest signal for benefit. It was the patients who, uh, who got in because of hypercapnia and lung stretch, and also those who had a you know, less than 80, but a still a relatively higher uh, PF ratio, suggesting that a lot of the benefit we're seeing with ECMO was not the rescue, per se, but the avoidance of ventilator-induced lung injury. Another important thing to remember is that this study was done in expert ECMO centers. <clears throat> Complication rates were very low. There was more bleeding, obviously that's to be expected, but there wasn't a significant difference in the amount of intracranial bleeding or stroke or other major uh, complications. Now, if you read the, the, the editorial, that goes, the main editorial that goes along with this paper, 
it says, uh, nevertheless, at least one important conclusion can be drawn. The routine use of ECMO with severe ARDS is not superior to the use of ECMO as a rescue maneuver. And I'll just point out that that is incorrect. <clears throat> That's a, just because something is not shown to be different doesn't mean that it's the same, right? And here we need to take a step back and say, well, how do we interpret this when we say the p-value is 0.07, when we see such dramatic results that suggest that there may be benefit? And here we need to be a little bit philosophical. This is this, uh, an interesting paper about are all p-values created equal? Not really. Here they say the p-values are necessary but insufficient. The reader must estimate the prior probability that the research hypothesis is true. This is another way of thinking, okay, we need to think like uh, Bayesian anal analysts, which is actually what we do in real life all the time, right? I'm pretty sure that the sun is gonna come up tomorrow morning. You're gonna have to show me an extremely convincing test to, to make me believe that the sun is not gonna rise tomorrow because my pretest probability for that is extremely high, right? On the other hand, things like this, there's very, I can show you very low p-values to say that homeopathy works. I don't believe it. My, this water memory stuff, I just don't believe it. So, or here's another example of a relatively high p-value, which I do believe because ventilation with lower tidal volumes makes sense for all people, I think. So this gets back to fundamentally how we interpret randomized trials. So quote my friend Gordon Rubefeld, people either say, oh, I already knew that, or I don't believe it. Now, if we wanna make this a little bit more scientific, we can actually do the math about pretest probability and the new data that we have. And this is, this is a Bayesian analysis, and this is uh, work that one of my colleagues, Ewan Gallagher, did showing here there's, you know, there's a range of priors that, that, that one might have. There are some who were strong believers before, others that were relatively agnostic, and others who might have been strongly skeptical. And we can model those in different probabilities here. You can also take an approach where you use the prior data, so data from the Caesar study and data from these match trials, to say, okay, this is what we know so far. How does the new data from Eolia change that? And the bottom line is that no, no, matter, no matter which way you cut it, there's a very strong high post-test probability that ECMO saves lives. The chance of reducing, of finding a 4%, or there really being a 4% absolute reduction in mortality is in excess of 80 or 90%, even if you were skeptical beforehand. So you say, oh, that sounds like a little, little bit of fancy hand-waving. Hand -waving. I don't really believe that. I you say, I, I really like p-values. I want to see a p-value below 0.05. Okay, no problem. We have a conventional meta-analysis as well, which combines the results of uh, Caesar and uh, Eolia. And now we have a very nice 95% uh, confidence interval that excludes one. And you can put on the, uh, all of the observational data as well. And you can see here, everything is pretty consistent. The only outlier over here is because in this observational study, they, had, they couldn't match uh, a lot of young, healthy patients that did well. And that's why their results are a little skewed. So we started off hmm, almost 10 years ago now <clears throat> when we had the Berlin definition with, the, with this sort of schematic, things that we, things in yellow were th things that we hypothesized about but we didn't really know. Uh, things in blue were things that we thought we knew. I'd say 10 years later, we can talk a little bit more about some of these things this afternoon. I'm putting ECMO up here in the very severe ARDS patients in blue because I think that's a pretty, uh, a pretty convincing story we have now. And a practical approach to this is to remember that not everybody, we don't go from walking in the door to on ECMO in five minutes. There's a protocol, there's a algorithm that one needs to go through. And it's about treating the underlying cause of ARDS, employing standard uh, lung protective ventilation, 
sometimes diuresis, sometimes uh, resuscitation, depending on the, uh, the patient volume status. And then looking and seeing where you are. Is the PF ratio less than 150? That takes you down a path here where you think about prone positioning and you consider neuromuscular blockade and a higher PEEP strategy. Then, after you've done all that, if the PF ratio is less than 80, or you're having trouble with uh, high airway pressures and, uh, and ventilation, then that's, a, that's a, a reason to put the, somebody on ECMO in my books. So I think we've got data to suggest that VV ECMO probably reduces mortality in severe ARDS patients. who have a PF ratio less than 80 for six hours, and who are at least, at least half of whom are already in the prone position. It has an effect, uh, a robust effect size with the Caesar study. And really this was a state-of-the-art control group that 90% of whom received prone positioning. But it needs to be done in high volume expert centers. And this idea that we'd reserve ECMO only for rescue, I think for me is A, I think the results are not as good, and it's also relatively infeasible because that means volumes will go down and expertise will go down and we won't have the same results. And so with that, I'll be happy to stop and uh, take questions. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Las preguntas las vamos a tener que dejar para el receso pueden acercarse con, los, con cualquiera de los ponentes sin ningún problema. Y a continuación eh, vamos a tener un, eh, un espacio de 20, 20 minutos para, para que ustedes puedan salir y reiniciaremos. ¿Bien? Muchas gracias.